Good to have uh, Anna Stastu from Penn State University, who is a uh, world reader expert in the field of small x physics, going to tell us uh, everything from here a few LHC to the economic. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, as you see, I, I did modify the title a little bit because I thought to, to go a little bit broader. Um, uh, and of course, small x physics you can study at uh, uh, various uh, high energy colliders. You can also study them in astroparticle physics in the context of ultra high energy neutrino physics or cosmic ray physics. So I wanted to be a little bit uh, broader. This is uh, hence. Uh, from HERA to LHC to AC, also, there is also left in the middle. Uh, and um, I, I, I divided this lecture, and we'll see how uh, we, we do in time, in, in sort of two steps. So the, the first lecture today is going to be more mostly focused on, on theory. Um, and uh, tomorrow I will focus more on phenomenology on, and on specific processes and where you can, uh, where one can search for the, the small x uh, effects. So I will uh, start with basics. So with the uh, uh, CIS paradigm and how it is uh, described in within the colonial factorization and dig lab evolution. And then a um, little bit of motivation of why one really wants to go into small x and why one would change uh, the description for this particular region. So we move a little bit back in time here. And then I will um, focus on the BF girl, introduce what is the BF girl evolution at small x, and then uh, spends quite a bit of time on, on uh, uh, an next to leading block and on the resummation. Uh, this part is gonna be more more technical. And then uh, the next uh, part would be to, I will, I will focus on part on saturation on the other corrections that are necessary to include that small x. And that is part on saturation and the nonlinear evolution equation and the saturation scale. And if time permits, this is kind of a bonus. I don't think we get there, but I put it just uh, if the problems of impact parameter dependence. Um, so, and then uh, this is for tomorrow. So I will mostly talk about the phenomenology. So this is for, for tomorrow. So uh, let's start from the, the deep inelastic scattering diagram. We have a lepton. Uh, here is an electron coming in, scattering of the proton. So we are thinking of inelastic scattering. Proton uh, is really an elastic scattering for a a part on, <clears throat> and uh, we have two variables. Very important is this is a small x stock, so it's important to know what x is. I once talked to a student after some summer school or lecture, and she said, Well, this top was great, but um, I forgot what x was. So, uh, you know, <laughs> so the x is defined, so q square, big q square is the, the photon. Uh, virtuality you can think of as a resolving power and York and X is defined as uh, Q square over two Q. Uh, so it's roughly speaking, uh, goes inversely with the W square where W square is the total energy of the photon proton system. So here I made, uh, uh, was uh, uh, be careful to distinguish between these two energies of the photon and proton and electron or proton. Later on, I will be less careful, but you know, as, as, as an energy which you pump into the, into the system. So as S goes, uh, as S is large, then X becomes small. And essentially this X has interpretation of the longitudinal momentum fraction of the proton carried by the, uh, by the struck quark. Okay, so um, if we're looking at an inclusive, um, deep inelastic, uh, uh, cross section, then the, the, the cross section is differential in X and Q square. And usually you can describe it into non-polarized case uh, uh, for the case where um, essentially the Q square is less than the, uh, the mass of the Z by two certain <laughs> functions. Um, and they encode all the information about the proton um, 
the hadron structure in general. Um, so F2 minus FL is the um, transverse structure function. So it corresponds to the transversely polarized photons. And FL is um, longitudinally polarized for the longitudinally polarized photons. And often the experiment give uh, this quantity, which is the reduced cross section, because this is what they this is what they measure, which is a combination of F2 and FL. So it is important to note that, um, so this is essentially dominated by F2 structure function, except for large values of Y. Um, to measure FL, one has to do measurements at different energies. But uh, we will come back to this uh, structure function FL. It's, uh, it's very important for small X physics. Um, okay. so. When we are at large, so we have x and q square. When we are at large q square, then this is the picture that uh, we have in mind. We have a say proton coming here, a lepton coming this way, and this lepton undergoes a large angle scattering. So it's, I tried to reproduce in this uh, cartoon what is actually happening in the experiment. And then you have a, um, this quark is struck, and then there's a bunch of stuff going out. And the idea at large Q square is that the incoming particle can be treated approximately as a free particle. And um, essentially the idea is that because Q square is, is large, then whatever happens is at very small distances and short time and it separates from everything else. Uh, now, so, so this is a very, very short distance, whereas all the other distances are hadronic scales. So we have a separation of the scales. And so that picture is sort of the basis of the collinear factorization um, at large Q score. Schematically can be um, uh, depicted like that. So we, we can factorize hard scattering in this upper blob, Cj, which is a coefficient function. And then the non-perturbative information um, is encoded in the parton densities. And this is the factorization formula. So we have this coefficient function uh, expand, can be expanded uh, in powers of alpha s and, and the parton densities, which are non-perturbative distribution here. They have longitudinal momentum fractions at a given scale mu square. So this is um, sort of all nice. And then we have radiation, right? So then we can include the radiation in the So in part of model, we have scattering of, of one quark, but then we can emit gluons from different lines. So here, for example, we can emit a gluon like that. It will carry some fraction of momentum, but we can emit more gluons uh, we can also have processes like that. So we have initial quark and then we will come in, splitting into uh, another quarks. And then we have gluon splitting. So before essentially um, interacting here, it can split again. Okay. So it's important to note that, yes. These are single gluon lines, but they're just showing the color and the color. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. So they, these are, I, so in this picture, I tried to trace the color here, right? Um, so these are, of course, exceptions of the of the particular uh, color factors and, and couplings. These are sort of a QED-like diagrams, whereas this one is is unique to non-abelian theory. And this is what uh, what is really um, interesting and um, what is driving novel small x phenomena phenomena at, at small x in particular, as we would call So we can reduce more and more gluons and even more. And the challenge is to actually be able to compute them um, for some these emissions in some way. And so even <clears throat> though these emissions are suppressed by power of the coupling, you can have enhancement by some logarithms, okay? Uh, so now, so what we have in a collinear approach, and here I, I try to also do a cartoon that kind of gives you an idea of, of different types of approximation. So um, let's say we want to 
we have the deep inelastic scattering. So we have this photon here. I'm not drawing electron anymore, and a, and a, and a proton, and we we have this exchange of mostly gluons, right? I will concentrate here um, on gluons, and we have this these two parameters. And in this collinear approach, we have q squared going to essentially infinity and x fixed. And the idea there is that you uh, basically perform this resummation uh, by, uh, so that the dominant contributions are coming from the stronger and in transverse momenta. So you can imagine that there is this large Q square, which provides you a, a very large uh, scale. And however, the transverse momenta are not allowed to have um, uh, arbitrary values, but rather we're talking about this strong order. And so if you think of what type of logarithm you, you pick up, then um, each vertex, of course, you, gives you a coupling. And then uh, you pick up the uh, integration. They have nested integrations like that, uh, which gives you um, which gives you a, a power of, of uh, dogs and and a couple uh, constant. Okay, so um, so that is that is uh, uh, this collinear approach, which leads to Diglab evolution. So you can encode that in um, in evolution equations. So um, this would be the generic form of these evolution equations for quark and gluon density. So uh, and you have a matrix of um, splitting functions, so which describe uh, splittings, they can be uh, computed perturbatively, uh, known up to next next leading order. And these are the leading order uh, splitting functions. I just uh, listed them here. So you have all kinds of uh, all kinds of transitions, but you have in general you have this uh, this this matrix here, and uh, this is a differential equation in uh, in mu squared. This scale uh, mu, which essentially um, is uh, related to to q squared here. Okay. Uh, next leading order expressions are, of course, a little bit longer, but not uh, very much. Next to next leading order are, of course, much, much longer. They wouldn't fit on this page unless I use a very, very small font. Um, okay, so that framework, Diglab evolution plus uh, collinear factorization, gives a very, very successful description of the HERA data. So this is this reduced cross section that I. Um, that I uh, mentioned. This is a, it's a function of Q square for different values of X. There is some um, scaling factor to make these uh, uh, data points not, uh, not uh, make a, a nice illustration. And you see the, the fits that, uh, that are really, really very uh, successful. Okay. Now, two things. So this, um, this region where this function uh, is, is spread is uh, sort of a scaling region. And here you see scaling uh, violation. So you see excellent description using DGLAB, uh, HERA PDF power indexes. Okay. okay, so, and then you can extract uh, the power of densities from, uh, from these measurements. So this is an example here in, um, the difference between this plot and plot, this plot is just a, a scale in X. This is a logarithmic, this is linear scale. Um, so you see the valence quarks here, which dominated large values of X. But then you see this strong rise here. Um, this gluon and C are um, the same scale. So they are not rescaled here. They are rescaled by 0.05, kind of to illustrate um, sort of to, to put on the same plot, uh, but you see that they, they rise very, very strong towards uh, the small x and then they dominate, uh, dominate in this region. Right? So uh, that is a question, you know, how, is there anything interesting? Yeah. I'm sorry, what's the difference between these two graphs right here? This is just a linear scale. And oh. this is here a logarithmic scale to blow up this I region. See which is, and then here you see these um, are rescaled so that um, they are 
factor <laughs> 0.05 rescaled because otherwise they would be off the scale. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, so this is just to illustrate how, you know, the, the, this is really uh, what is driving <clears throat> the structure function. So if you're this um, cross section, which is at very, very small X, is really driven by functions um, which are steeply rising towards small x. And um, yes, yeah, so, so the question is what, what happens at, at small x? Uh, uh, can this rise uh, uh, sustain, be sustained to, towards small x for forever, or maybe it's modified? And is it the right description? <clears throat> is the collinear plus d glob the right description? As we go to and this as this parameter is very small, yeah. How, how does how does it go above one? X is a fraction, and F is a probability of distribution, right? No, I mean, so yeah, this this can go above uh, this can go above one. So there is um, there is no. I mean, the only um, really what you're okay. You're right in that uh, you can, so this is the gluon density. Now, what do you can, you can relate the gluon density to, to um, the scattering amplitude, for example, what is called the dipole scattering amplitude, I will show you later on. And that function cannot go above one. There is a unitarity limit, okay? But th not this function, so it, it's not like, one for this particular function has any meaning here, okay? But it, but you, you're absolutely on the right track. <laughs> this this quantity is related to uh, another quantity that you can uh, impose this condition one, and this is where we come into the unitarity and saturation question later on. Okay, okay. So um, so why small x? So now we have to travel back in time. Um, to uh, the 60s or, or so, uh, where people thought about how to describe processes uh, without um, essentially quantum field theory of strong interactions. So this was not existent yet. And they looked at the properties of, of um, scattering from the generic, um, so, so there were some, several generic properties, like that the S matrix would be Lorentz invariant, there would be crossing in parity analyticity, analyticity. So for example, if you have this uh, amplitude to, to, to scattering as a function of uh, two Mandelstam variable that have some, uh, some specific properties. I, I'm not gonna go deep into that because that's, that will be another series of lectures. What I just want to get is that um, when the Reger limit was defined as the one where you go to S to infinity, so uh, energy going to infinity, and T, the momentum transfer finite. And then um, one can write this amplitude, roughly speaking, as some function of T times S to power of alpha T. And this is interpreted essentially as a scattering and an exchange of something uh, called the Reger trajectory. Um, and it can be parameterized as some constant plus alpha prime T, okay? So there is no QCD here, it's just uh, uh, the S matrix uh, properties. Now, why is it interesting is because um, one can put uh, different mesons in so-called two Crouchy plot and uh, plot their masses and, and spins and they form um, sort of this linear relations. So, um, and then you can ask, what is this object, this region, uh, when you have a very, very high scattering. So is there, so in other words, the picture is 
can the high energy scattering be described as some sort of exchange of some object? And from optical theorem, you can um, change the, you can find the relation between the amplitude and the total uh, cross section. And this relation would immediately give you that the total cross section should behave as some uh, power of this uh, S. Um, and it will be alpha minus one, okay? So this alpha zero, this regular trajectory determines the behavior of the cross section, okay? Now, uh, Alcon Pomeranian should call the empires then find this word Pomeron, that this is, that if you look at the cross sections at very high energy, um, then uh, you should have this, this uh, pomeron, which is the region with intercept greater than unity. It would correspond to the exchange essentially of vacuum quantum numbers and will dominate the cross section uh, at asymptotically high energies. Okay. Yeah. yeah, so, um, right. So, so Exactly. So, so, so here, for example, you have the proton-proton cross section, um, and um, you can parameterize this in many different ways. But, um, for example, you can parameterize this as uh, I mean, there are many uh, very sophisticated parameterization, but you can parameterize it with some power which is slightly bigger than one. So the cross, so, but this power, of course, so this is one mine, so this is this minus one, so the growth would be 0.11, okay? So something like that, okay? Roughly speaking, yeah. This is for linear as you what if you include a nonlinear term? So, no, so here I'm not really interested. So this is really, um, yeah, so, so this is uh, for, um, so the intercept dominates the energy cross section, okay? So the, the T is another story, which um, maybe I will come to that if, when we talk about the background. Anyhow, the, so this is where this interest in the high energy behavior, uh, sort of the, the story from, from the S matrix um, comes into the, into the QCD. Um, that we are looking at if there exists something like the object that is exchanged that governs the energy behavior at the very, very high energies. Now, just a side remark, such soft pomeron, soft meaning this 0.11 is, is small, is actually in conflict with what is um, a, called the, usually a Frassard bound, which stands for the unitarity requirements that actually it cannot go faster than the log squared. So, um, but for now, um, we will not uh, sort of uh, talk about the, okay, something is, I think I have one. Okay. So, so then we are back in QCD mm -hmm. and we are asking, well, is there something like a Pomeran in QCD and what, like what would you need to compute at high energy to, um, to recover this, this, uh, this Pomeron? So the high energy limit in perturbative QCD, so we are looking at an S, which is much larger than T. Alpha is small, and uh, we are looking at logs now. Alpha is logs of S, potentially over some S naught, which are of the order of one. <clears throat> and so, we are kind of trying to peek into this diagram and say, well, what is inside this blob? So the first model is a so-called lone Lucinov model is a two gluon exchange that would give you a constant cross section. But then people realize, well, if you dress, start to dress this two gluon exchange with multiple gluon emissions, then maybe you get an energy enhancement. This is what is called the BF Pomeron, which is this gluon letter in theoretical kinematics and I will now try to explain how is it constructed, okay? So we are going back to our picture of, and I think I changed, I flipped it around, doesn't matter. 
So we are still looking at deep inelastic scattering. Let's say I have a photon and a proton and I have S here. But now what we are looking at is a different type of uh, ordering inside this cascade. Remember, we were ordering them in, in transverse momenta. Now we are looking at the different limit, different regime where S is much larger. And Q square is, we want it large, but uh, fixed, perturbative. And we, if we think, for example, in terms of, of um, light variables, then um, we can have, the, uh, say, P plus, which is defined as P0, P plus PZ, and then the KI plus, which is the plus momentum of the gluons, is a fraction of x times the p plus, and we want the strong ordering in these fractions, okay? So it's a different type of ordering, fine. Uh, alpha s, alpha s small. Uh, I'm using here alpha s bar. Uh, that's just the rescaled alpha s because it comes with usually n c over, over pi or c over pi. So it's, it's just uh, known that. But now, tip, just like before, we had these nested integrals of a transverse momentum. Here we will have nested integrals over, uh, over this longitudinal momentum. And you pick up logs of x or one over x each time accompanied by alpha s. So in some sense, topologically, it's the same going cascade. It's just that you're uh, resumming it in a different way. And so you're, you will resum the powers of this type or if you wish, the powers of the, of the energy, okay? So that's how you would uh, construct this, uh, this cascade. And this leads to, this can be resummed by a similar evolution equation. It's just in a different variable. So, and this is this df gal evolution equation by Stefan Gravely part of that looks analogous to DGLAP. So remember DGLAP was, in, I wrote it in mu square or in q square, is dfd log. There was mu over d mu square. It was splitting function convoluted with a integrated gluon density. And here is, is similar, it's, but it's the, the, the variables are different because here it's convoluted in transverse momentum. So the transverse momenta are integrated over. So this here. And then the evolution parameter is, is logarithm of X or logarithm of S, okay? And so this K is, has also perturbative expansion, just like splitting function is, this uh, is a function that will have leading log X, next to leading log X, and next to next to leading log X. In QCD, we know two first terms in supersymmetric theory, in um, also in next to next to leading log X. And so, but now we have a different function here, uh, which uh, we, so the, the small x community, I think usually called it an unintegrated gluon density. Um, so I'm, I will use that notation. The transverse momentum dependent gluon density, it's used by the, the transverse, uh, by the TMD community, which is a, a different form. And so here, this object is satisfying this equation here, okay? So it's an analogous, so it's a, it's a different direction of the, of the evolution. Okay? It's a different way of resumming these goals. Okay, so now I'm gonna dive deeper into, uh, into technic, technic, into some technical details of this, of this evolution and show you what are the problems and how you cure them and how you relate to, to DGLAB. Um, and, um, it's usually useful to go into the Mellin space where you introduce some variables and I introduce gamma and omega. So you essentially make a, a Mellin transform. So if you have a function of X, you <coughs> transform, you have a function of omega. If you have a function of K square, you Mellin transform, you have a function of, of gamma. Yeah. Uh, on slide 17, this, the diagram where we have the X's ordered in yeah. this way, I think I'm sort of missing the main point here. 
<laughs> is there an object at the top that's emitting a gluon with this energy and it loses energy as it goes down and it's hitting the thing at the bottom, which is wrong? What's happening in this physically in this diagram? Well, I mean, like, so you here, you would attach to a quark. And then the, the point is it's here. So what you want is you, you think of, so, so you need a very, very large um, energy here, which means that essentially this X is very, very small uh, because essentially it's kind of, maybe it's even easier to think not in deep inelastic, but maybe in some symmetric situation, we have a proton, proton, you have sort of two objects going the other direction. And now you, you think of, of gluons being emitted when, you, when they are emitted close to one proton, then they kind of carry a lot of momentum of, of this proton. And then as you proceed, they carry less and less. And then, so this is, this is how you would think about it, right? And here, of course, you attach to a quark, uh, somewhere, yeah. And that quark was hit. Yeah, yeah that quark was hit. So this is what, what would be at the very beginning um, of your, your cascade, yeah. Okay. So, um, okay. So, so now I want to show you how the solution, a uh, little bit solution and, and, and the problems there. So you, you have an equation like, like this, you can many transform it. So you have two different um, variables and then once you do it, it actually becomes a very easy equation in these variables. You can solve it. And there is some homogeneous term. And then you have um, pi then is a many transform of this kernel. Okay. So this is just that function here. Okay. So this, so, so there is a singularity which will determine the high energy behavior because once you go back with this unfold the Melling transforms, this singularity is going to determine the high energy behavior of, of this function, the small x behavior of this function. Okay. So, um, so how this kernel looks like actually in Melling space, it, it's, uh, it's a nice function like that. And um, it has infinitely many poles in this variable gamma on the real axis. Infinitely many poles. Now, what these poles, what do they mean? Okay, I mean, somehow, many mm -hmm. space might be difficult to, to think about, but they, they have some uh, nice interpretation. They, these two poles here at zero and one, they correspond to um, strong orderings in KT in this cascade. Okay, so Remember when I when I started to talk about Diglab, I, I said something like you can think of this cascade as being strongly ordered in transverse momenta in Diglab. In this BFK approach, you have strong ordering in longitudinal momentum, but you don't have ordering in transverse momentum. All the transverse momenta are essentially integrated over because you have like there is no restriction here. So these two poles, so in particular, if you have all orderings, in particular, you have strong ordering in one direction and the other direction. So these two poles can be interpreted as a strong ordering in one direction and in, in the other direction. And then you have infinitely more poles. Uh, of course, it's, it's more complicated. Okay, so, so this is how you, you think. So, so it contains the strict strong ordering of, of Diglab. <coughs> <clears throat> now, so when you solve this, <clears throat> I have to go back maybe uh, this slide. So when you solve this equation, what you have to do is we did many transform. Now you have to invert it. Uh, now what what happens is that <clears throat> what determines the high energy behavior is the value. The intercept is actually given by the value of this function here, because if you were to go to the imaginary axis, you, this function goes down. This is a saddle point. So it's actually a minimum here, okay? So this omega p is a chi at value one half, which has, uh, which is the same as four log two, which is 2.77. It's a large number, right? If you plug in 0.2, you're getting 0.5 as a growth. It's a very strong growth. So, um, 
So, so that is um, what BFCAL gives you. It gives you indeed very, very strong growth, but it's too strong for the, for the data. We, we don't observe such, uh, such str strong behavior, neither in HERA data nor, of, of course, in proton pronoun collisions. So, um, so certainly uh, this approximation is not enough. One has to go beyond. So anyhow, summarizing here is that we have these two different uh, evolutions, the d evolution in log q squared, the BFK evolution in log x. Um, and this BFK evolution is, now one thing already visible here is that in d you can kind of start here. Uh, and let's say you can say, well, this is one GV or two GV and you, you're, you, you don't really care much about the non perturbative region. Here, because you're evolving like that, um, and the integrals of a transverse momentum are unrestricted, well, now you have to worry about it. There is a danger that one actually enters into this non perturbative region. So it's sensitive to this region. But in some sense, it's expected because the original Braja limit doesn't know about alpha s. It's saying, well, I have the high energy and a transverse momentum, momentum transfer that has to be smaller. There is nothing about the strong coupling in the S matrix approach. This limit is taking into QCD. And then we, we put in, we put additional assumption that alpha S has to be small, but um, it is in fact um, sensitive to non perturbative region. And I can um, explain it, for example, in a, in a different, <laughs> for example, in a, in a process um, where you have two uh, part scales. Um, yeah. Okay, slide 21. Yes. Uh, how do you see that there are infinite number of poles? How do you see that there are infinite number of poles? Oh, yeah. So this function has, yeah, I mean, I, I'm, so here I'm plotting this, this function. So the, if you plot the D gamma function, it has infinitely many poles. Thank you. <laughs> this, is, this is a mathematical plot of this function. I, I'm just, Putting here, da, da, da. I mean, there is plus da, 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 many poles, okay? Um, so there are, there are these poles, but there are other poles. Um, okay, so, uh, okay, so now let, let's look at, at this cascade. And let's say I put here, instead of a proton, I want to have another hard scale. So I have two hard scales. Could be two very hard photons or two jets. So, the way to imagine this, uh, this cascade now, this y is like log x or, or log s. You have some kind of a random walk in transverse momentum as you go along this letter. Each time you emit the gluon is emitted with some transverse momentum. And if you plot transverse momentum here, you can sort of see that it's some kind of a random walk and then you, you can sum over all of them. If you start your, your cascades with uh, very high scales, which are outside the non perturbative region, you might expect that typical transverse momenta in, this, in these cascades are going to be also very large. But what happens here, as you enlarge this cascade, as you make it longer and longer, what happens is there is like a diffusion. You have a chance of, you know, it's a random walk in, in KT, so you have a chance of going into the non perturbative region here, even if you start with very, very high scales. This is called the diffusion of transverse momenta in towards both the infrared and UV. Of course, it is once you put in the running coupling, things get worse because the coupling pulls you naturally to the infrared. So, BFKL is going to go into the infrared no matter what. Okay, so there are large non perturbative effects for large energies. Okay, so it's a very different picture from 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 the club. So uh, now continuing on to um, higher order corrections. So they have been calculated. This was the leading order 
result. And the uh, next leading order corrections were mainly from the running coupling, from what is called the kinematical constraint and from part of DGLA. You see, what happens is that we're looking at essentially these gluon cascades in two different limits. One is the global limit and one is BFKL limit. When you compute higher order in BFKL or vice versa in DGLAP, you kind of recover a full DGLAP. So in the next leading block BFKLs, you start to recover other terms in, in DGLAP. So an expression is not very long, but it's more complicated, but it's useful to look at these different poles. And now something funny happens because instead of having single poles, you start to have double and triple poles. Like here, you would have double poles, double poles, and triple poles. And um, that makes things behave rather um, in an unpleasant way. Um, what happens is if you now take the next link log, so this is next to leading log, but just taking out the collinear poles, okay, that are double and triple poles, you calculate this next to leading correction. This is chi next to leading, a pure next to leading term. Um, this is the full one. This is the collinear part. You see it's negative. It's very large. And um, it's pretty much dominated by these poles. Okay. Now, phenomenologically, um, this correction now, so remember we had a leading part, which was a very, very strong rise. You will compute the next leading part. Now you get a very large negative correction. Okay. So your series be behaves uh, in an unpleasant way. Um, so the, the origins, so these parts are, are technical, but I hope that I can explain them. So what are the origins of these very um, big corrections? One is the running coupling that can be easily resummed into the leading log. So this is not a very big problem. The other part is DGLAP anomalous dimension. So if you look at my one of the first transparencies that I had at DGLAP, uh, splitting function. If you look at the GG function, the full leading order DGLAP has this form. Okay. Now you can you can Mellin transform it and you get an anomalous dimension which looks like that. It it is one over omega plus some term. If this this term at zero is minus 11 12. And if you kind of look here is 11 three and four, the coefficient here in front of this double pole is precisely this term. So this is what I'm, I'm you know, trying to dig fish out from this formula, the physics uh, that is manifest. So at the next leading log D, uh, BFKL, we are, pick, we are picking up terms that we know are in the leading order D glove, okay? Because in principle, if you were to do the resummation of, of you know, compute DGLAP or EFCAL to all orders, you would have the exact results. So they should match. It's just you're doing the expansion in two different directions. So this is this term is this other um, very big contribution. The other contribution is that. If you look at this integral, uh, as I said, these signals are unrestricted in principle in the high energy limit. However, one can argue that one needs these type of constraints. Actually, you, you cannot have unrestricted uh, transverse momenta. You need constraints on real emission kernels because the virtualities of this exchange moment are dominated by the transverse components. So you need restrictions coming from the kinematics, which strictly speaking, if you're in a very, very infinite energy limit, 
this shouldn't matter, but it starts to matter if your energy is not infinite or anything that is you know, less than the energy of the universe. So um, we need to have these type of restrictions um, inside. And now things are becoming very, very interesting because now the equation is integral, not the differential. Yes. Yeah. And you figure out what the restriction is to, to, to assume on shell particles or yeah you so the, this guy has to be on shell first and then um basically the virtuality of these have are dominated by the transverse components and then you end up with with this type of restriction and then what happens is now this is a huge effect actually a huge effect um and what 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 happens now is that, and this is why the menu space is so uh, nice because it's, it's very clean, you get something like a, a shifted pole here. So your, your pole is not at one, but it's shifted. Now what you can do is you can expand to first order. So you expand this function, you get a, a double pole. Now using this relation, which is a solution of leading log to, to eliminate this, this, this omega here. So you plug in this function, you get a triple ball with the correct coefficient. So by restricting appropriately the integrals, okay, you can recover the next to leading log terms in the BF curve. However, you have more because here you see I did an expansion, right? If I just restrict, I have this function. So you have an all order effect, okay? Which should behave much better than if you expand something to the first order and behaves. Right? So you, you perform, automatically you perform a, a, an all order resummation at the expense of now having a much more complicated equation because it's no longer an equation which is differential. It's really an integral and different, well, it's an integral equation. Um, I have 10 minutes, right? Okay. Um, now, this uh, is in some sense also related to what is called the scale choice in, uh, in BFGL. Um, it's, if you, if you have the scattering of two particles with some scales, Q and Q naught, okay? Um, and you can write the cross section as uh, the solution to BFGL, which I call the growth means function here, and then some two impact factors, some two functions that describe how this bond couples to this photo. Um, when you do this inverse main transform, you put S and then you have some scale here, which you, you can have different choices. For example, if you have two photons, you would like to have a symmetric scale. If you have a DIS configuration, then actually is Q squared. So it depends on what uh, what is your configuration? So there is a scale choice here. And um, this, these different scale choices actually matter beyond the leading log approximation. So if we have an asymmetric scale choice like in DIS, like what I um, um, alluded to before, before um, this asymmetric scale choice will require these cutoffs on transverse momenta to be put in a particular way. And this will lead to this choice, but you can have a reverse configuration. So I could have also a shift in the first ball. But if I have the symmetric scale choice, then I need to shift both balls by a half. Um, so it ties into this, uh, to this scale choice. Either way, I mean, this resums a tower of subleading terms to all orders, some subleading terms, of course. I mean, 
uh, coming from here. Now, an amusing fact is that um, you can say, okay, does this work? Or can, can we verify that this works um, beyond the next log? And the answer is yes. So if you expand for the symmetric sketches, if you expand this, this function, like I showed you, you get triple poles. These are recovered at next leading log level, but we can expand more. We can expand to power uh, omega squared and you get, how they call it, quintic poles, right? That would be, right? To the R5. Now there is actually a um, result at next to next leading order in super young means theory. If you look at the highest poles, they are exactly these. Okay, so of course, this simple shift doesn't reproduce all of the <laughs> results, but it does reproduce at least up to next to link and up to next to next to link order the highest uh, contributions. Okay, so um, anyhow, that was. That was very, very, um, very technical, but I, I hope to convey some, um, some message here that we have a BFK leading X, a next to leading log X. You need to do the resummation, but we kind of roughly know how to do it. We need to in, include some um, kinematic constraints, include d glob splitting functions. Um, of course, one has to be careful not to um, do the double counting, but you can do, um, but you can make some prescription. And this is the, here, the result illustrated. So this is this Pomeron intercept omega, which is a function of the coupling constant. This straight line is 2.77 times alpha s, right? It's a linear function, right? So the at point two is, 0.5, it's a, it's a very steep rise. Uh, the next leading log, if you were to compute it, it's a function like that because it's a very negative contribution. But then you can do the resummation. Now there are some ambiguities. You get a function like that. So if you're looking at values of alpha s 0.2, you have the intercept of 0.3. So that would be your rise of the cross section, for example, at Hera, which would be about 0.3. Right? So that looks much more reasonable, like you would expect something between this and this, right? <laughs> so this is how, why you do the, the resummation. Okay, so in the remaining, well, maybe I can take 10 minutes or so, because I really want to talk about saturation. Um, well, that was um, just taking into account going into the small x limit and computing uh, this, this cascade uh, using a different type of ordering. But then you see that this is no matter you know, what you do, this is gonna lead to very large density of loans. Okay? So the question is, does this go like this or like that? And um, you need to take into account other effects that we haven't talked about, and that is gluon recombination. Because the only thing that I have talked about was gluon cascade and gluons emitting and emitting and emitting, and two different ways of, of computing them. Okay. Now, on a more fundamental level, it is really re um, related to uh, to the requirement of unitarity of strong interactions, and there are different approaches. Um, one is through what is called the dipole splitting and multiple scatterings. Uh, the other is by Jan Baliski. This is operator product expansion. And then there is uh, what is the, called the CGC color glass uh, condensate, which is essentially an effective theory with uh, renormalization group equation. They are all related and lead to, in a very basic level, they, um, they have one they sort of um, have uh, the same equation. So they have a common limit, which is called the Baliski-Kovchagov equation. 
Okay. Now, what is important is that both small x and large A effects, which I have not talked about, can be addressed in, in this format. So I'm not going to go over the derivation of it. It's very uh, complicated. But if you think of, maybe you can think of it in some way. So if you think of a fast quark and then some, some probe, and then they exchange a gluon, then you can think of this fast quark as some kind of a color charge. Um, and now you, when you do these emissions, like BFKL, what you're effectively doing is like you're renormalizing this charge, okay? It's the initial charge, okay? So um, the, the effect of additional gluon emission is like renormalizing the, the effective color charge. But now what you can do is you can say, well, Suppose you, you, you not only are able to treat this simple um, case, you are able to treat a, a case where you have multiple color charges. And then what will happen is that you have these different sources and coupling to this, to this probe. So that would give you some kind of a nonlinear evolution. Now you can have a different picture. So this is sort of a picture where your nucleus is fast. You can have a different picture of the same process where let's say you have a nucleus at rest and you look at the, at the photon and this photon can fluctuate into uh, QQ bar and then these QQ bars can emit gluons. And this is like developing the whole cascade. And then you can interact with this Escape. And you can think of that as some system with dipoles, color dipoles. And then if you have a, a nucleus, then these dipoles can scatter in multiple of a nucleus. So this is a different way of viewing essentially the same process. So this is a multiple scattering in sort of a rest frame of, of a nucleus is viewed as a and then previously as a recombination of gluons in the framework because it's very fast. So this is where we are going into your question as to um, is there a limit to the gluon density? Now, usually the equation that is um, been studied, this, this is the balitsky kovchagov equation, is written for a different object for N, this is called the dipole amplitude, but it can be related to this function that I have talked about before, this unintegrated gluon density. So there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between them, okay? So one is F and this one is N. This one is a function of the dipole size, R, which you can kind of think of one over KT. And usually the rapidity is, is just a log of x. So this equation can be cast, roughly speaking, onto this equation, which this part we already studied. It's a BFK term. And now you have a nonlinear term. Okay, now we have a nonlinear term. Now, in this formula here, you see that what happens is that this function, like if you know nothing about uh, this equation here, you see that one, if I plug in n equal to one, this satisfies this equation, right? Because you have one plus one minus one minus one, okay? Then you have the right-hand side is zero, then the derivative is going to be zero. So there is going to be a point where this function grows to one and doesn't grow any more, okay? So uh, this is the also the, the colored glass uh, condensate. So what this equation does, so the linear term, which is written in these variables, but you can recast it in, the, in terms of F, is the gluon splitting, which is governed by the VFK. So this is increasing this density. But this nonlinear term, this red one, is gluon merging, okay? Or multiple uh, scattering of, and there is certain 
what is nice is there is certain equilibrium where the nonlinear term is going to compensate the linear term. Okay, so this is what is uh, leading to part on saturation. Okay, so um, this is the, the, the usual plots that probably you have seen. Now, so we have a D grad evolution which goes this way, BF grad evolution which goes this way, but at some point, if you go this way towards <coughs> this region here, you enter this, this nonlinear region. And roughly speaking, this QS is a scale dynamically generated that separates one region from, from another. Okay, yeah. Um, when we, um, just a question on this uh, last graph. When we evolve Q, wouldn't we see even more patterns uh, in evolution? But, it's, but of course, they, they would seem smaller, so they would not move the yeah. overlap. Yeah, but, yeah. Uh, when we evolve in Q, we would also see more patterns, but they're also smaller. When we evolve in X, we see more patterns, but they stay the same this size. Yes. So effectively, right. So effectively, your, um, how should I say? It's, it's more <clears throat> it's more likely that you encounter this region if you go this way, right? That's uh, region. Whereas if you region. if you were to, you know, here, of course, you can ask the question, well, maybe there is some region here in DGLAB that you would need to modify your initial conditions. And then you're talking about higher twists, effectively, because that's, that's what it boils down. Okay. Now, this saturation scale, roughly speaking, goes like X to uh, some power. This power, which is very similar to this Pomeron intercept, it's about 0.3. But then there is, it's enhanced by uh, nuclear effects, okay? Now you can roughly speaking, uh, it, it, it sort of stems from this condition where you have a gluon density times alpha is over QS approximately equal to one. So this is sort of the object that would be approximately equal to one when this gives you the, um, the condition for the saturation scale, okay? So the saturation scale is generated from, from this equation. It's, it's sort of a division between, roughly speaking, where this linear term and nonlinear term, they start to, uh, where the nonlinear term can start to play a role. In the context of the EIC, what is very important is that there is this enhancement on the nucleus, okay? The EIC is large, moderate, maybe a little small x, but what, you can gain in terms of going into the dense region is when you have, when you perform the DIS on, on nuclei. So you can search for saturation either by decreasing X or by doing DIS on nuclei or both and see how, how they differ. Um, maybe the last slide, because I'm already over time, just to show you what is the solution of this equation. Okay, so this is this dipole amplitude, this N, okay, which you can relate to the gluon density, but then the gluon density will not have this one nice behavior of one. This one does, okay. Now, so here, this is the size, which is now the inverse transverse momentum. So let's say large transverse momenta are here, small transverse momenta are here. So this is more going into the non perturbative region. This is actually some initial condition just out of the mind, <laughs> some, some initial condition. What happens is that you evolve in X, the smaller X goes this way. What happens is this curve moves here, but then it saturates to one. It never goes above one. Right. Um, and then what you can do is, well, what is saturation scale? There is, you know, it's a very smooth functions, but you can say, okay, let's say I take this function equal to one half and define the saturation scale at this point, okay? It's gonna have different normalization if I vary it. But um, what you see is that as you increase your X, 
this one over QS moves to smaller and smaller values. So this is what translates into the growth of the QS in the previous plot, okay? Okay, in this plot, Y is log one over X, QS <coughs> behaves this way. So it's, it's becoming larger for smaller and smaller X, okay? This is how you see it from this equation here, right? This is a sort of when you plug in some initial condition, there is, there is a large growth. And then here at some point it, it saturates. And this is really the condition also that this um, amplitude does not, well, respects the unitarity limit, okay? Uh, so I think this is a good time to stop. I was right that I will not have time to go into the impact parameter, but that's that's okay, and I will be happy to take questions. Yeah. So comments. There's no idea about this breaking. Like, is, is that an assumption that you have to obey unitarity, or? Yeah. So if you okay, so. At this, obviously at this equation, yes, because what, what happens at this equation is you see what happens, right? So, so this becomes zero and then the derivative is zero, right? So you don't have a growth. So this is of course under this assumption for, for this equation. Now, um, this is a leading log and next to leading log it holds also. So that's, uh, that's fine. And of course we know that the entire D is respected. <laughs> Uh, but um, so this is very, very encouraging um, that this quantity does, does respect that, right? And, and you know that if I were to drop this, right, then this, this curve would not go to one, it would just keep growing, and that is your BFL, right? Yeah. Part time distribution function probability that the part time is going to have a momentum fraction this over some small range. Am I misinterpreting what F is? Probability this. Yeah. The probability, therefore, it can be larger than one, but you can normalize it such that the integral is a one. So you sort of Okay, so maybe I can go back to detecting on something. And this particular combination, x times f, I believe gives you the momentum fraction carried by particular partners. You can count partners. So that if you do these integrals correctly, then you have two upwards, one down. Yeah, so if you're, if you take these functions and then integrate them over, right, then uh, you have different sum rules, right? So you have like, like say mentioned, so you have a momentum sum rule if you're integrating these functions like that over the, from zero to one, so they add up to one, uh, or you also you have the, um, the valence, the, the num fork number rule, so then you have essentially if you integrate these guys, but U valence and D valence. So, but as a number like that, then no, because so you can imagine that you can have function that is normalized, but you can kind of move it around. Um, so that is, uh, so it is, so, so you can, you can cut, so the evolution can push it you know, towards small x, no problem, because you see what, you know, if you integrate from zero to one, this function, it's gonna get very small contribution to the momentum sum rule. Well, it, it's gonna get some, but uh, you, know, it, um, you can modify this function quite a bit, right? The evolution and the D-glove, of course, respects the momentum sum rule. Now, BF curl doesn't unless you do the resummation. Okay. So that's the 
that's the thing that uh, you actually have to do all these things to to that I showed you all this magic with with uh, resummation. You imposing the the momentum sum rule will um, restrict the the growth. So. Um, which, which is on the, you know, related with the fact that you're doing strong ordering. So whereas D club, you don't have it, right? You have an exact splitting. So, so the kinematic of the longitudinal momentum is straight. So, so that is conserved, yeah. Yeah. Can you say that when you go into the more perturbative regime, when you start radiating into that regime, you get pulled further in there? Yes, because that, that's right, because you have alpha S, you, you will have a coupling. Um, <laughs> you will have, well, for example, um, well, whatever here, right? This kernel has a coupling constant, right? And this, if you start running this coupling constant, you have integrals that um, are going into the inferred region, right? So um, that's you know that's that's the that's the becoming the, the the problem here, right? Right. Uh, this strong ordering is this something uh, some constraint that you put into the into the process, or that it is to happen in the process? This strong ordering. Well, what I mean, it is just, um, so it's, it's a limit in which you put uh, this amplitude. So, so here, essentially what you're doing is you're, so when you construct this, okay, so how do you, how you would compute this K? You would, would have, uh, as, so the way you would, you would do this is you would consider, let's say, two particles that are moving very fast, exchanging a gluon, and then emitting the gluon. Okay. And then you're asking effectively what you're asking in the calculation is the dominant contribution of your Feynman diagram, which picks up the alpha s times the log s. Okay. And so you're making approximation on that level. And that results really translates into the Strong ordering of this momentum, right? So that's, that's okay. So, kind of like the starting point of BFKL and DigLab is that they make different dominate uh, observation, right? They think different things dominate. They are, they, they are right. So, so they are, you know, the, in some sense, you have topology of diagrams, it's basically the same, but you make a different approximation of your, your models, right? And then you, but then what happens is, when you go to higher orders and compute, for example, here, um, so you go, for example, D glove to higher order, like take D glove at next to next to order, you start to recover some small ex so some small ex effects. So I think you recover next uh, one term in next to leading BFKL. If you were to go to d -glub at next to next to next to leading order, then you recover uh, some terms in uh, which are coming from the leading order BFKL. So, so you start to recover different terms if you go one, because you're doing the expansion to different directions. But once you go to higher orders, you have, you start to see um, the, the that they coincide. And in fact, they coincide also at the beginning because this term, um, suppose you, you, you take a D-glap here, this term, okay? You, you, this is a gluon, right? And you drop everything except of one over Z, okay? You have one over Z here, and then you have, um, you have a log of K squared. And then at the BFK level, what you have to do is, where we are with this equation here. So this log one over X is corresponding to one over Z splitting function. Here you, you take approximation that basically uh, you take a square much bigger than K prime square. So this will give you, um, this will give you essentially one, you end up, you, you basically cut off this integral with K squared. 
and you recover. So this is called the double leading log. So they, they have a like one common term. And this is also visible here. So this term is in a sense, this term is in DGLAB. Okay, so they have common terms. It's not like it's something different. It's not some common terms, but just a, for some directions. Thank you, Anna. Let's thank.